Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Um, Courtney asked me to come up here and uh, bring some perspective. Um, before I get into that, it's crazy. Every time she gets scheduled to speak on a Sunday night or whatnot, there's always some natural disaster, right? You got tornadoes, you got cold, all that stuff. And today's no different. The natural disaster today is we have to put up with more Taylor Swift while we watch football. <laughs> right? Right. But she did come up and ask me, she wanted me to come up and share with some perspective. Uh, we're coming up on two years of marriage. Um, so being married, I do have some new perspective on space. Right? And I'm not talking about that kind of space. I'm talking about the personal space. You know, her space is her space. And my space is her space. <laughs> right? You know, and, and then a new perspective on food. You see, I can't just go out and stuff my face full of ribs anymore, you know? Kind of have to eat healthy. And I thought, I thought the whole meaning of being a dad is growing the dad bod. Right? <laughs> but you know what? Not everything that tastes good is always good for me. You know, and I, it, it's been training my mind to see things differently. Did I hear someone say something about training? Ah! Bestie, you didn't tell me you would be here. Oh, my goodness. Are you doing training? You know, I love training. Whenever I'm doing training, I always love to take things to the max, right? Did you tell them? Did you tell them about me? How I love to do training and your training and we can train together. Right, but I, I was talking about training of the mind, not not, well, not of the Well, training of the mind and training of the body go together. And I know that you've been sticking to that workout regimen I gave you on J January 1st, right? What? <laughs> <laughs> Good thing I'm here. A little less conversation, a little more action. Now, I have the perfect verse to get us started in our training tonight. Don't you want to hear it? Don't you want to hear it? Don't you? Don't you? <gasps> I'm sure I'm going to hear it. <laughs> Yes, you are. Now, this is one of my favorite verses about training, and since you're training, right, training the mind and training the body, I thought we could work it out here together tonight. What? In front of we could take it to the max. You know how I love to do that because of my name. Did you introduce them to Guys, me? this is Maxine, Maxine the crowd. All right. Yeah. I, Ma thought, I thought that'd be a little more boisterous, but I, I did it's a start. But. All right. Now, I can tell that they need me as much as you do, because if we want to get scripture in our mind and in our heart, then we have to start with our muscles, right? Our muscles and our memory are connected. And so I'm going to put up a verse, a training verse tonight that is going to help your muscles uh, you need a lot of help. All right. Your muscles and your memory connect. Should we do it? Now, I know you get a little nervous about your exercising. So maybe if we all stand up together, because I don't know if you've been following my regiment since January 1st either. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to get my verse up there. I'm going to get my music started. And you just follow me as always. Do you still like squats? Perfect! All right, let's get started. Kick it. Do a little shoulder action just to get started. All right, everybody, come on. You're, are you too cool for this in the back? I see you. All right. Get it together. This is for your good. All right. We're going to do this first, and it's going to be good, people. All right, let's do it like this. Training the body has some value. You're going to have to do better, people. When was the last time you exercised? Here we go. Training the body has some value, but being godly has value in every way. Deeper. Being godly has value in every way. Now we're going to do a little run because you look like you, you need to run. All right? It promises help for the life we are now living. Running that race. Running that race. Double time. Double time. Very good. Promises help for the life we are now living and the life to come. 
Let's finish it. First Timothy, 4-8. <laughs> All right, you got it in you one more time? <laughs> I hear no one. <laughs> Tough crowd. <laughs> All right. Are you sweating? Do you feel the burn? Are you taking it to the max? Here we go. Training the body has some value, but being godly has value in every way. It promises help for the life we are now living and the life to come. First Timothy 4, 8. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Fan your neighbor. Don't smell their armpits. Just fan them. <laughs> that felt good. That felt good. That was a good way to get our training started. And you look like you needed it. Tell the person next to you, good job. 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 All right. Great job. Now, I'll leave you with that, but don't forget, training the mind and training the body, training the heart and training the soul are very important. Can I trust you to keep up with your regiment? Yes. You all heard it here. All right. You good people, take a seat. The children can be dismissed, and I'll let you sit down. Good sir. I'll let you sit down. Oh, are you guys pumped or what? I hope so. <laughs> I know Sunday nights can be a little bit tired after a long day, but hopefully you guys can stick with me. So, a little kids' church taste tonight just to liven things up. This video was all full of what? Anybody tell me? Illusions, okay? Little mind games and tricks. How many of you guys remember Magic Eye? It was like a 90s era thing. And I still, for the life of me, can never figure out Magic Eye. <laughs> like that last one, I couldn't even tell you what it is because I, I don't know. But I do enjoy the first one, if you could put that up, PZ. That um, one that is like the, there we go. The duck and the rabbit, right? Do you guys see both? Who sees the rabbit first? Just interested to know. Who sees the duck first? Interesting. I wish I could tell you something about yourself, but I really don't know <laughs> what that means, except for maybe you like ducks and maybe you like rabbits. I don't know. But these illusions are all about your perspective, right? What you're looking at. Where is my focus? Can you put up that coffee one too, just because that one's like my favorite? Did you guys see anything kind of weird and wacky in this one? Did anybody see it? Do you see these little faces at the bottom of this man? Do you see it? His little nose and eyes, I think he's there three times. Did you see it? Suddenly you're like, what? What? There's somebody's head in my coffee, right? Because it just wasn't, it's not what you focus on, right? Can you still see it, Pastor Jeff? No? I think it's a little bit better. <laughs> Sometimes our focus is just on the wrong thing, and then we don't have the right perspective. Perspective is a way of thinking, I'm sure we all know, about, about something and how we understand something. And when we focus on a certain thing, it affects our perspective. And as Christians, what should be our perspective? Every kid in here would be like, Jesus! I know, I know Pastor Courtney, I will give you the right answer. Jesus, becoming more like Jesus. And I'm sure we would all agree, as Christians, we want to become more like Jesus. And as you heard previously from the illustrious Maxine, my good friend, training the body has some value, but being godly has value in every way. It promises help for the life you are now living and the life to come. And I think we could all agree, we want to live our life focused on God, doing things his way, but when it comes right down to it and the rubber hits the road or the chips hit the cheese, as we like to say in kids' church, <laughs> what does it mean? And how do we truly live this way every day? These are great questions. And thankfully, we have a great starting point, the Bible. So hopefully you have your Bible. If you have an electronic version, I'll allow it. Although in kids' church, we're paper all the way. Okay, so we like to put up our Bible because we get a little bit excited about it. So I brought the music that we use. Put your Bible in and the kids are like, they all put up their Bible. We get excited about God's word. So usually we just have a couple of scriptures, but I know you guys are like next level scripture people. And so we're going to be jumping around a little bit. So you can try to follow along. I know we'll have them up on the screen, but it's always good to dig into God's word for yourself. 
and fact check me and make sure I'm not telling you anything that's not true. All right? Not that I would do that. So we need to remember tonight that God sees things differently than we do. And first we're going to turn to Isaiah 46.10 in the OT, the Old Testament. (laughs) I know that's so exciting. Isaiah 46.10, some of you are awake in here. And I'll have that up too, okay? He knows the end from the beginning. I'm sure you know this verse. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come, I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 say, his ways and thoughts are higher than ours, right? My thoughts are not like your thoughts, and your ways are not like my ways, announces the Lord. The heavens are higher than the earth, and my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Then we turn way to the back, Revelation 1.8, which is pretty easy for the kids to find. They like Genesis, and they like Revelation. (laughs) You probably do too. Revelation 1.8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, the one who is and who was and is to come, the Lord Almighty. So we know God knows the end from the beginning. His ways are higher than ours. He always was and he always is. And comparatively, if we put ourselves into perspective, our lives are like a breath of vapor. If we turn to the middle of God's word, to Psalms, Psalms there. (laughs) In Psalms 144, verse 4, we read, Lord, what are human beings that you care for them? Mere mortals that you think of them. They are like a breath. Their days are like a fleeting shadow. How's that for encouragement, right? (laughs) How about Psalms 39, 4 through 5? We'll just turn back a little bit. That one says, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere hand breath. The span of my years is nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. So in the short span of our life, even before we were born, God had a plan and a purpose for this. This is stuff we talk about often, right? We can see in Jeremiah 1.5, before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. Hallelujah. Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. This is my favorite verse growing up, maybe some of yours too. Jeremiah 29.11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So this should put things in perspective for us tonight. Nothing puts things in perspective for me like God's word (laughs) and his truth. Our God is greater. He's higher. He's more powerful than we could ever imagine. And yet we are known by God, loved by God, created for a purpose with a plan. Our lives are not by chance. They're not by accident, no matter what anybody says. And we have the privilege of being a small part of his master plan. However, our time is relatively what? Short, right? We all know this. Our time is relatively short compared to eternity. And we don't have many days or months or years to live the life that God created us for. So what do we do with that? Well, let's dig in. I love reading missionary biographies. And if you have never read one, they can be so inspiring. You can Google some missionary biographies and some short ones will come up. But there's different series like Heroes of the Faith and just people that have gone before us and God has just been so faithful in their lives. And I love to read those in addition to um, God's word just about his faithfulness. And I've read about missionaries that their lives are shorter than most. And yet their lives make, make a huge impact. And I just think, why? Their lives are so short. Why do they make such a huge impact? It was because Their perspective in life and how they lived their life was shaped by knowing and living out their purpose, even for a short time, and it's powerful. I remember reading about William Borden. I got a little picture just so you know he's real life. What a looker, right? Mm, Okay. So (laughs) I remember reading about him, and it stuck with me so much, his story. And you might have heard of him before. He was a young man. He was called as a missionary at the turn of the 20th century. And he was like from Chicagoland area, and that's where I'm from. So I think I just felt a tie to him somehow. But he led many, many to Christ before his death at only 25 years old. Only 25. He was born a millionaire. He had things lined up for him from the time he was born. He could go right into his family business. He had more business deals than any of us could ever hope to have. And that could have easily shaped 
his perspective. But it didn't because he understood his purpose. And one of his college classmates wrote, he came to college far ahead spiritually of any of us. He had already given his heart in full surrender to Christ and had really done it. We who were his classmates learned to lean on him and find in him a strength that was solid as a rock just because of his settled purpose and consecration. What a testimony for a young man. During his college years, and this might be where you have heard of him before, Borden made an entry in his personal journal that defined what his classmates were seeing in him, and the entry simply said, say no to self and yes to Jesus every time. And that is such a challenge to me. Say no to yes, say no to yes, wait, wait. Say no to self and yes to Jesus every time. And during his short life, Borden led many people to Christ often going out of his way to go into like the poorest parts of Chicago, which he would have had no business being as a millionaire, but he had business there because of Jesus. And he challenged others to follow his example and not to waste time, but to be about his father's business. I thought, how cool. So he passes away at 25, and we might say, what a waste of life, right? But not from God's perspective. As the story has it of this missionary biography, Prior to his death, Borden had written these words in the back of his Bible. No reserves, no regrets, or no reserves, no retreats, no regrets. That's kind of what he's known for. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. What a perspective, right? Of living life. You probably heard a famous quote by Abraham Lincoln. And in the end, it's not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years. And now we have a lot of... um, Maybe some of you have that on vinyl on your wall at home or something. (laughs) That's become a a catchphrase, right? It's not the years in your life. It's the life in your years. But it's really true. It's true if we think about it. If we really think deeply. Jesus gave his life for ours, not so we could live a life wasted on things that don't really matter. But so we could live out God's purpose for our life. In Ephesians 4 verse 1 Give you a minute to turn there if you'd like to. Hey, and you guys, you know what? In February, we're doing a big books of the Bible challenge to learn all the books of the Bible in order. And I just want to say, if you don't know all the books of the Bible in order, you could do that and get a tie-dye t-shirt too. Mm -hmm. I'll extend that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because not everybody had the opportunity to learn when you're young, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of fun and you can do it. I believe in you. Mm -hmm. Anywho, Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4.1, Paul challenges, he even begs the believers to start living their lives in a way that's worthy of their calling. And the Amplified Bible explains this excellently. What is that worthy living? So I'm going to read this in the Amplified Bible. Ephesians 4.1 says, So I, the prisoner of the Lord, appeal to you to live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. That is, to live a life that exhibits godly character, moral courage, personal integrity, and mature behavior. A life that expresses gratitude to God for your salvation. Mm. Whew. Mm. Mm. I live my way in I'm life in such a way that, God, I'm living out gratitude to you because you saved me. What a perspective. Paul challenges the Ephesians and us today to live life worthy of his divine calling. We have purpose, and because we have purpose, we have to move towards a life that looks and sounds and acts and behaves more like Jesus. Because as Christians... Mm. What other purpose do we really have if we're not living that one out? A life worthy of the calling. Paul challenged the Ephesians' perspective. And as Christians, I want to present this idea to you. Our perspective can't truly be godly without recognizing and pursuing our God-given purpose. Our perspective cannot truly be godly. I felt like God put this so deep in my heart for this message without recognizing and pursuing our God-given purpose. And our purpose is either ignited or extinguished by our priorities. Our purpose is either ignited or extinguished by our priorities. And I know in the Fresh Wind messages, we all got something that started with P. It was great. (laughs) All right? But I felt like a lot of those things overlapped. Perspective, priorities, purpose, all these very exciting things. But they go together. So this takes us back to our question from the beginning. What is the main thing? Jesus, right? Becoming more like Jesus. So how can we shift our perspective and our purpose and live that out? Does how we fill our time reflect this truth? And this is why I was like, 
man, Lord, this is a good message for the beginning of the year. And then it turned out to be like the middle of the month and now the end of the month. So God just may be giving us more chances <laughs> to get it right. How do we, does how we fill our time reflect our main thing? Is our time filled with meaning or meaningless activities? Do we fill our schedule with purpose or purposelessness? Are we in control of our schedules or are our schedules controlling us? I'm sure you've heard that before. Many things we do have value, right? Just like that verse said at the beginning, 1 Timothy 4.8. Many things we do have value, but being godly has value in every way. And when we were planning these messages for tonight, they said, okay, in perspective, we want to talk about how to keep the main thing the main thing. And that's actually a quote by Stephen Covey, uh, you know, the journal guy. <laughs> Helped people manage time and all those things. He said the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Sounds redundant, but I mean, come on, guys. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And a purpose-driven, God-glorifying life does not happen by accident. Your children in this room or your grandchildren are not going to be raised godly by accident or just by a hope or a wish or a dream, okay? It's got to be intentional, keeping the main thing the main thing. Romans 12.1 from the message, I'm going to read a couple from the message just to change it up on you guys, okay? says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, that sounds like me, your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9 in the message says this. Settle in, it's kind of long, but it's good. It says, love God, love God, your God, with all your heart. Love him with all that's in you. Love him with all you've got. Write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you, and then get them inside your children. Whew. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to the time you fall into bed at night. Amen. <laughs> that's me sometimes. I don't know about you guys. Fall into bed at night. Tie them on your hands and foreheads as a reminder. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your homes and on your city gates. When we understand and live out our purpose to become more like Christ, everything, 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 everything we do starts to flow out of that. And suddenly, our perspective shifts and our priorities change. As a church kid, I grew up hearing these two words, spiritual and secular. Mm. We don't listen to that music. It's secular. Mm, all right? And I got very good at knowing what was spiritual and what was secular. How many of you guys can relate to that? Okay, we don't do, we will not watch that movie. Okay, that is secular. And it seemed to me like those were really clear categories. Even at the library where I checked out CDs. I hope you guys can relate with me here. No kids have any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I, when I would go to the public library to check out like a Point of Grace CD, and I was so tickled by that, <laughs> to listen to that. I remember my mom would say, you can stay in this section because this is where the spiritual music is. <laughs> and all the rest were like, not for you, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I just say that because it was really clear to me that things inside the church were spiritual and things outside the church were secular. <laughs> But the more I matured as a Christian and the more I started to teach kids about what it means to be spiritual, I realize everything we do as Christians is and should be spiritual, right? There should be no separation. That's like living a double life, a double standard. And that's not godly. If Christ's spirit, reside, Christ's spirit, spirit <laughs> resides in us, everything we put our hand to is for his glory, right? In fact, did you guys know when I was studying for this, the word secular actually means without God? And I thought, here's the problem with that. There is no place on this planet where God does not function. And we are not designed to just do missions like a missions trip, only when we're overseas or we're scheduled this time to be godly. We're designed to be on mission every day, no matter what our job might be. And I remember when I was a kid, sometimes it would get over-spiritualized, I feel like, that you were called to be a pastor or called to be a missionary. And then people that didn't have that calling, well, great. <laughs> yeah. 
But the reality is that real biblical ministry is done by God's people, wherever he put them, wherever they find themselves, because we're living our life for him, right? And so we're not designed to just be on mission on a missions trip, or just when we're at church. We're to be on mission every day, no matter what our job might be. Colossians 3.23 is one of my favorite verses to read for the kids. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So that means I make the most of every opportunity in my workplace, in the classroom, Cleaning, shopping, planning meals, <laughs> parenting kids, influencing grandkids. When I interact with people, and I wouldn't be doing my kids' pastor job tonight, which I love so much, if I didn't give you the gentle reminder of the importance of living out a God's godly perspective and purpose in front of your children. Okay? Notice I didn't just say teaching them. Mm. When I open the Bible, that's when God is in our house. Mm. No. Mm. Okay? Honestly, who we are and what we do communicates far more than what we say. Mm. In children's ministry, we say that spirituality is more caught than taught. Mm. More caught than taught. We're living models for our children and those around us. And let me tell you, if you don't already know, kids can smell a phony. Mm. Huh. Mm. They can smell a fake. (laughs) And when they pick up discrepancies between between their parents' lips and their lives, they are way less likely to embrace what we believe. If we live with a double standard, our children are only going to have one, and that's the world's. There is power in our example. We have to be what we want, our children, our grandchildren, those people that we are influencing, we have to be what we want them to become. That, de- that demands both dependence on God and personal discipline modeled for them to see. And it, when, when it comes to perspective as a parent and a person, it helps to begin with the end in mind. Have you ever heard that before? Mm. Begin with the end in mind. Where do I want to be? Mm. And if I think about that before I start, mm. then it shapes what I do mm. and the direction I go. So you have to zoom that lens out and take in the big picture. So tonight, I just have a little, little, bit, little bit longer. You guys are, have stayed with me so good. But I want the Lord to help us wrestle with some things. I want us to think about what is the desired direction and destination that we want our kids to be in 10 years or 20 years? Where do we want to be in 10 years, 20 years? Have you thought about it? It can be a little bit scary. I tell you what, but it's important. And I'm not talking about like the possessions you want to have. In 10 years, I'm going to own that boat, okay? I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about possessions or profession or power. I'm talking about purpose. Living out our purpose, our calling, what we were created for. Are the things we're doing now going to get us to that desired outcome? Yes or no? Not really any maybe. (laughs) It's either yes or no. And that doesn't, that doesn't end when you're old. I know I'm, I'm getting older. You guys have seen me get older. I've been here for 16 years now. I used to be just a baby. Now I'm just a crazy older lady. I don't know. But <laughs> this is such a good reminder that until you're dead, God's still got a plan for you because there's no in-between. Until you're in the ground... God still has a purpose for you. It's your choice whether you live or doubt or not. And you might be like, Courtney, girl, you young, okay? And you're right. But I have some really godly older people in my life that if they hadn't kept on purpose and mission, I wouldn't be here. So never, ever let the enemy negate or minimize your purpose. Don't let him do it. My grandma turned 100 this year, my great-grandma, and I got to celebrate with her, (laughs) and a whole bunch of people came that she had influenced, 
and she has lived her whole entire life in O'Connell Falls, Wisconsin, this little tiny town, and she had planned to stay there, you know, till she died. And she decided this year, she told my mom, hey, it'd be really nice if some people came in and like helped you out with meals and stuff sometimes. And my mom said, that's called assisted living. <laughs> you can do that, you're 100, right? And so, so my grandma said, all right. And she packed up all her life and she moved to Zion, Illinois by my parents. And so she's in this place called Barton House, assisted living. And she could just be like, well, I'm 100. Now it's time to just sit back and relax and... Do, you know, do whatever. But that would be the furthest thing from my grandma's mind in the history of the world. A, she exercises every day in the Barton house. I went and saw her and the exercise lady was like, your grandma is, I can't even, I don't even know. What, what keeps her going? And my grandma is like about this tall and she's like, well, I told you it's Jesus that keeps me going. Like, <laughs> right? And she, she was in there for like one day and I'm, I mean, some of you guys know what, what it takes to uproot all your life uh, and move and downsize and move into this place. And she could have been like, this really stinks. Uh. But instead, she told my mom that night that they moved her in, I know why I'm here. It's because people here don't know how much God loves them, and that's what I'm here for. And when we had her birthday and there was people in there, uh, she stood up, she goes, could I say something? Uh, yes, uh, it's your birthday, uh, right? Uh, she says, I want you to know that my life is all about love. And not the world's kind of love, but God's kind of love. And people, if they really knew how much God loved them, they couldn't help but follow him. 100 years old. And she goes, and I will live that out. I'll proclaim that in the lunch room and in the exercise room and in wherever room I'm in until the Lord takes me home. And I thought, man, we not, might not be able to change the whole world, but we can change our world right here. And there's people God put in the Barton house for such a time as this that my grandma would speak truth in their life and they'll be in heaven because of her. And there's people in your life that you have the opportunity to speak into that nobody else can. For such a time as this, you're in a right place. It doesn't matter how old you are. Your kids, I can't even tell you, the people they prayed for in church this morning that don't know Jesus, <laughs> that is on their heart today because they're in the right place. They're in school and God planted them there. You're in your work, God planted you there. You're retired, God planted you there. Mm. You go to McDonald's in the morning and you minister to those people and God planted you there. Mm. Live your life on purpose. What are we showing others are the most important things in our life? Not by what we say, but how we live. What are we showing through how we allocate our time? How much time do we spend on social media, extracurricular activities, watching TV, or on our phones? And let me tell you, kids see everything. <laughs> and so do others. How much time do we spend in worship, prayer, Bible reading, with and in front of our kids? A children's pastor friend of mine said recently that his wife would make breakfast and do her devotions in front of her kids every morning and he would go into his study and do his. And you know the one that they came to with their problems, even though their dad was a pastor, they went to their mom because they saw what her life was about. And it wasn't that he wasn't doing it, it's just that it was modeled for them through her. Mm. Perspective. Mm. How much time do we spend ministering to others and sharing God's love? I read this week, well, that was a few weeks ago now when I actually wrote this. <laughs> there is a 0 0.0296, imagine how small that is, a 0.0296% chance that your child will become a professional athlete. Yet there is a 100% chance they'll stand before Jesus one day. Oh, that was a motivation for me. <laughs> I don't know what was. And that's true for all of us, right? There's a 100% chance that every person in this room is going to stand before Jesus someday. And don't get me wrong, I, I can't get enough of cheering on your kids for sports and drama and all the things. And they are so cute and precious, the things they put their heart into. But what I want to circle back around to this is the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing, right? 
I heard the quote recently, the key is not to prioritize your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. And I thought, how true that is. I'm trying to live that way. <laughs> and so let's just consider a few things. And I'm almost done tonight. I know that's like a pastor's uh, famous saying, right? <laughs> I'm almost done. Mm. Only seven more pages. Mm. No, just kidding. Mm. So I want us to consider tonight a few things. Mm. So everybody sit up nice and straight. Mm. Eyes watching, ears listening, hands and feet to yourself. Mm. This is where we're going to bring it home, baby. Yeah, so I don't want you to miss any of these things that the Lord wants to say to you. And I know I can get kind of tired at this time of night. Mm. Let's consider a few things together. What percentage of our time are we investing in things that are not the main thing? It's not that those things don't have value, but what is the cost? Are lesser things costing us time that should be spent on the main thing? Time is fleeting, formative years are passing. What are we teaching our children to prioritize and what are we prioritizing? Are the things we focus on and the way that we live our life moving us towards our purpose or away from it? All things to consider. Mm -hmm. I kept, even before I put together the rest of this message and I felt like the Lord really led me to different scriptures and things to say, the first thing that he gave me was this writing by a missionary called C.T. Studd. Mm -hmm. If you've ever heard of him before. And I have it up in my office and I read it almost every day. And it challenges my perspective and it challenges my priorities. And I'm going to read it to you. So everybody put away your phone, Mm -hmm. your Bible. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay, you can close your eyes if you need to focus. But I'm going to read this to you. And it's a little bit long, but it is very challenging. It says, two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord, to meet and stand before his judgment seat, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads me for a better choice. Gently pleads for a better choice. Bidding me selfish aims to leave, and to God's glory will I cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears, each with its days I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep. In joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, that e'er the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn, and from the world now let me turn. Living my life for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yet only one. Yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, t'was worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. We all know we're going to stand before God one day. And our desire, and what my my 100-year-old grandma I know it's in her heart to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, right? And if we begin today with the end in mind, what would be our well done if it was from God's perspective? I asked God to help me begin with the end in mind for this message, and the very first thing he spoke to me besides this, this, this writing by C.T. Studd is he said, tell them to ask me, Lord, what is my well done? Lord, what is my well done? What is it I should do on earth to fulfill the purpose you have for me? Come, Crane. Maybe it'll be that you change your priorities and really put me first. 
You gave up lesser things for the main thing. Maybe it's you led your family to become more like me. You modeled your faith in your workplace or your school. You didn't live a double life. You did everything for me. What will be your well done? I prioritized my life and made you first. What will it be? Lord, my prayer tonight, and I just want us to just spend a few minutes, just ask the Lord. The Lord's speaking to you. He's ready to speak. That's what we say in Kid Church. He's ready to speak. We just have to be ready to listen. And so tonight, my prayer is that God would give us his perspective, that he would align his priorities, align our priorities with his purpose. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And that's not meant to be like a downer. It's meant to be a challenge, an excitement that comes from being like, God, I get to be a part of what you're doing. What greater honor in life could there be? So let's just take a minute. We got time. And let's just ask the Lord. We're just going to, we're not going to sing anything. We're just going to listen. That still small voice. And ask the Lord, Lord, what is my well done? What do I need to do tonight to make my perspective all about you? Let's just spend the next few minutes. You're more than welcome to stay in your seat. You can pray. Let's just seek the Lord together in that and see what he would say. Okay.